In this podcast, we're going to deal with gene frequencies and genotype frequencies. And we can understand from basic Mendelian genetics that the effects of one allele at a locus can mask those of another allele at the same locus. And that's what dominant versus recessive inheritance is about. So if you think of what Mendel was doing with his pea plants, big W might have been wrinkled seed, and that would have been dominant to little w, which would have been smooth seed. And I don't need to go through this because you all understand that. Let's take a few minutes and talk about genetics and probability. And we think about this in relation to transmission of genes through generations. And this is important for risk assessment for genetic counseling because you could clearly have patients that might want to talk to you about what are the chances of having a baby with some disorder, especially if they've already had one child with a genetic disorder. And so if you think about meiosis, meiosis is like tossing a coin. And when you toss a coin, the probabilities are one half that you're going to get either a heads or a tail. Well, likewise, chromosomes are paired. So the probability that a given member of a pair will be transmitted to one gamete is a half. And the probability that the other member of the pair will be transmitted to the gamete is a half. And so this highlights the fact that the probability of all events must always add up to equal one. We think about the probability of transmitting one of two alleles at a locus that's independent from one reproductive event to the next. So if you think of tossing the coin, one coin toss does not affect the outcome of subsequent coin tosses. So the probability of getting a heads is one half every time the coin is tossed. If you toss a coin and get 10 heads in a row, the probability of getting heads on the 11th toss is one half. And that clearly assumes it's not a weighted coin. So what's the probability of tossing two heads in a row? This highlights the multiplication rule for independent events. So the probability of tossing two heads in a row is a fourth, or one half, times one half. And by the way, the probability of getting 10 heads in a row is really small, 0. 0.0009. What's the probability of a couple having three girls in a row? Well, again, it's the multiplication rule for independent events because every pregnancy is an independent event, so the probability of having three girls in a row is a half times a half times a half or one-eighth. You could ask this question differently, and you could say, what is the probability of having three children all of the same sex? In this case, the probability would be one-fourth, because there'd be a probability of having three girls in a row plus the probability of having three boys in a row. The couple has two girls. What's the probability of having another girl? Well, that's a half. So it depends on the types of questions you ask. Suppose you have a question, a couple wants three children, but not all of the same gender. Then you look at the addition rule for probability of either one outcome or another. So like in the previous example, it's the probability of having three boys or three girls. The probability of producing three boys is an eighth, a half times a half times a half. The probability of producing three girls, also an eighth. So the probability of having three boys or three girls is an eighth plus an eighth or one-fourth. Combination of having boys and girls is three-fourths because, again, all the probabilities have to add up to one. So let's look at gene and genotype frequencies. Suppose you have 200 people in a population for the MN blood group. M and N alleles are co-dominant. That means there are going to be three possible genotypes. MM, MN, or NN. Let's say you have 64 people that are MM. Let's say you have 120 people that are MN and 16 people that are NN in this population. That means the frequency of MM is 64 over 200, or 0.32. The frequency of MN is 0.6, 120 over 200. And the frequency of NN is 0.08, or 16 over 200. 
In this population, there are 400 alleles at the M and locus. So there are 248 M alleles, 64 times 2 for the frequency of MM, plus 120 for the frequency of MN. That means the frequency of the M allele is 248 over 400, or 0.62. And likewise, the frequency of the N alleles is 0.38, 152 over 400. Again, the sum of the frequencies of M plus N have to equal 1. This is the genotype frequency. This is the allele frequency. So the gene or allele frequency is not the same as the genotype frequency. Now the MN blood group locus provides an ideal situation to estimate gene frequency in a population because of codominance. Each genotype can be readily distinguished and counted. How would we calculate these frequencies if they were dominant and recessive alleles? Let's just assume that big A is dominant, and we'll say the frequency of big A can be designated as P, and let's assume that little a is recessive, and we'll say the frequency of little a can be designated as Q. There have to be three genotypes, big A, big A, big A, little a, and little a, little a. Let's assume the individuals mate randomly, and that's called panmixis, where you mate randomly. And let's assume the gene frequencies are the same in males and females. Now, this is a hypothetical example to show you how you would do calculations in relation to population genetics, because you might argue that humans don't necessarily mate randomly. But for the sake of the argument, assume that individuals are mating randomly and the gene frequencies are the same in both males and females. So this is the setup. So let's just say if P equals 0.7, that means 70% of sperm cells must carry the allele big A and 70% of the eggs would carry the allele big A. And we can represent that this way by just putting 0.7 in our matrix. Since the sum of the frequencies have to equal 1, 30% of sperm and eggs must also carry the allele little a or q. So we can designate it this way in our matrix. The probability of a sperm carrying allele big A, fertilizing an egg carrying allele big A, is p times p, or p square, that is 0.49. In other words, 0.7 times 0.7, that's 0.49. That's the probability of producing an offspring with big A, big A genotype. The probability of producing an offspring little a, little a genotype is q square, or 0 0.09. In other words, it's 0.3 times 0.3. Three. Carrying this forward, what is the frequency of the heterozygotes? There are two ways to get heterozygotes. A sperm carrying big A can fertilize an egg carrying little a, so 0.7 times 0.3, 0.21, or a sperm carrying the allele little a can fertilize an egg carrying the allele big A, that's also 0 0.21, 0 0.3 times 0.7. But because there are two possibilities, you have to add the probabilities. So the frequency of heterozygotes is actually 2pq, or 0.21 plus 0 0.21, 0 0.42. We've just demonstrated or derived for you the Hardy-Weinberg principle, p square plus 2pq plus q square equals 1. The Hardy-Weinberg principle specifies the relationship between gene or allele frequencies and genotype frequencies. Remember the genes or alleles are big A and little a. The genotypes are big A, big A, big A, little a, and little a, little a. So consider cystic fibrosis. It's a recessive disease 
only homozygous recessives little a little a are distinguishable the frequency little a little a or q square for cystic fibrosis is approximately one in twenty five hundred in newborn individuals so if you take the square root of that q that's the allele frequency the allele frequency would be zero point zero two if you then say p plus q equals one that means the frequency p has to be point nine eight the frequency of carriers big a little a for cystic fibrosis would be two p q so it's two times point nine eight times point oh two which is point zero three nine two that's pretty close to the actual observed frequency of the number of carriers of cystic fibrosis in the population because the number of carriers is about one in twenty five so I have a general question for you. What's the probability that, say, someone will marry a person who is a carrier of cystic fibrosis? Well, it would be 1 25th, because the carrier frequency for cystic fibrosis in the population is 1 in 25. What's the probability that that couple's baby will have cystic fibrosis? Is this right, 1 25 times 1 25? It's actually not right, is it? Because it would be 1 25th times 1 25th times 1 4th because it's a recessive condition. So the probability that the child would have cystic fibrosis is 1 over 2500, which indeed is the frequency of cystic fibrosis in the population.